so glad to welcome all of you and especially our speakers, Elsa Dorlan and Veronica Gago, to welcome you to this series of lectures. I am, uh, I see in the chat that the quality is quite bad. Is this the case with me at the moment? All right, I will uh, try to speak loud and clearly. A warm welcome from all the organizers from the Institute for Social Research, the Institute for Anthropogeography, and from Medical International to today's session of Psyches and Turmoil. We are very happy to uh, analyze patriarchy and powerlessness and the survival with Elsa and Veronica today. First of all, we want to say, say thank you to the activist interpreting collective Interprime. You are not only interpreting that makes possible political discussion, but behind the scenes, you show such great solidarity and you do such great work. So uh, many things and many things also to me uh, uh, for making possible an interpretation into French and from French today. Many things also to all the others who work behind the scenes to make possible this series of lectures. Especially Nela Eisbrenner, Benjamin Cortes, Lucian Kirschbaum, Andrea Schult, and Ralf Zöllner. I'm called Julia Manek. I'm a psychosocial consultant for uh, public relations at Medico International. And I will be facilitating today with my colleague Uschi Merck, who will be moderating the chat. In the last lecture, uh, Vanessa Eileen Thompson and Jamilo Ribeiro uh, together with Almut Popinga from the Institute, talked about the racist hierarchization of life in the wake of COVID pandemic and the cynicism of letting black people die or making them die. About the racist regulation of infection control and racist police violence that is showing itself and making it impossible to breathe uh, if it be George Floyd or all those who died of COVID. Beyond that, we talked about struggles and political visions and that are emerging, especially around Black Lives Matter, despite the pandemic, but maybe even as an emancipatory answer to the pandemic that we understand as a poly pandemic, which we, we think of the uh, pandemic being intertwined with militarization, poverty, and a pandemic of patriarchal violence. And this last pandem pandemic, has been called a shadow pandemic by UN women because uh, it is vir virulent uh, not only um, uh, visibly in the open, but in at home. Patriarchal violence has increased everywhere during the pandemic. Our medical partners reported from all over the world and also in Germany, statistics show an increase of and the base violence, which is no wonder because in lockdowns that are meant to save lives, women and queers are being locked up with abusers, with the offenders and perpetrators in the place that statistically is the most dangerous place for them in the world, which is their home. So the most visible and uh, the most irre irrevocable expression of uh, patriarchal violence is feminicide. This refers to murders of women and queer people in the vast majority of cases by their partners or ex-partners or family members, but it always takes place to secure patriarchal rule. So against being killed and powerlessness, uh, women and queers are showing solidarity across continents. And in that context, we always relate to the feminist movements in Latin America, who, uh, where there have been radical mass mobilizations for the right to one's own body and against feminicides and even the pandemic could not stop that movement and what we learn from latin america time and time again that those feminist mobilizations are that radical because they stated politic politically that feminicides are not uh, so incident and that the state as an institution is at full as well. Maybe you still remember the performance by Las Pisces in Violarada and Tucamino. Um, and 2019, that was very viral. 
and in this performance it is being said and it wasn't my fault neither the place i would nor what i was wearing the rapist is you it is the policemen and the judges the state um here we have a relation to last session because it's that same state that guarantees um police officers being without uh, punishment and that advances racist discourse and regarding that self-defense practices are very very necessary so this session it is it will be about patriarchal violence in the pandemic and the resulting effect dynamics dynamics of effect so we don't only want to talk about uh, fear and powerlessness as a paralyzing but we want to talk about uh, anger and a longing for other ways of life and uh, practices of resistance and self-defense and we're very much looking forward to discuss those with our speakers that i will present now veronica gago is, is a feminist activist and a professor for social sciences in the university of buenos aires as a critical theoretician you work for intersectional and economic uh, environment of violence and you do militant theory work as you say from the movement from within the movement so you're a founder of a, the collective Miuna Menos um, in Buenos Aires and as such you are decidedly a part of feminist mass mobilization so when we ask ourselves what feminist resistance can be and what other forms of the political and of living together uh, are possible your book for feminist international how to change everything is a milestone and you go really into the depths um, and the organs of patriarchy and you uh, have eight theses about um about feminism and um militancy and you say you talk about um subtlety and um, and in pa patriarchal and a colonial uh, environment and um, uh, in this conditions also with militarization in the pandemic uh, you talk about feminist self-defense and I'm very happy to talk about that also with Elsa Dolan who is a professor for philosophy at the University of Toulouse as well she's a militant feminist uh, very impressive she's also a kung fu fighter and i was very impressed um, by your witted analysis of violence and counter violence where you uh, show clearly the possibility but also the necessity of self-defense and you open that to an intersectional gaze your book uh, self-defense uh, philosophy of violence is really a milestone as well. You analyze the militants of different social movements against police violence, uh, against patriarchal violence, and you uncover the power techniques of the state uh, whose uh, monopoly of uh, power you question. And you do very surprising but very obvious turns at the same time. For example, you say, we do not only have to learn, we can defend ourselves, we have to unlearn that we must not defend ourselves. And that for me is a very central uh, phrase and that uh, brought something forward for me really. And I'm very much looking forward to, um, to get on with that. And now I would like, uh, first of all, to hand over the floor to you, Veronica to give us an insight into the struggles against feminicide, against powerlessness, from your perspective as a theoretician and as a militant activist in Argentina. And then I would hand over to you, Elsa. And afterwards, we may get into a discussion together, an open discussion. And everyone's welcome to write their comments and questions into the chat. And please do dare to ask questions, especially what you do not understand that will bring us all forward. So dear 
Vero, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Julia, and everyone who has organized the seminar. It's really a pleasure for me to take the floor together with Elsa in this discussion. And very thank you, big thank you to the Interpreting Collective who enabled us this event, this discussion, this multilingual discussion. The first thing that I would like to point out to is the criticism of the concept of a shadow pandemic and to speak about the idea that how, how the violence because of um, gender and ma machismo, it's in the um, background of the pandemic in the shadows. On the contrary, thank you, thank, big thank you to the militant feminism um, against sexual violence and feminist syndical um, feminist organizing and how how they've been organizing during the pandemic, um, especially in, or in Latin America and in Argentina was the first visibility um, and the problematization collective uh, was in the forefront of the debate. This brings different feminisms in order to make a characterization of the violence and to make uh, public pedagogies and how to understand the violences, in especially how people have been organizing, connecting, mobilizing against gender violence, um, especially against the Una Menos, have been fighting against structural violence and violence, economic, institutional, racist, and uh, labor. There is a big work being done politically and activistically that are diffusing what the, the, the reading of systemic violence mean. And in order to understand this form of violence in our own context and how this um, violence, um, how this violence fights against this codependency that basically enables this violence. The political, so the different, the, the conceptualizing of different uh, questions, for instance, my friends take care of me, not the police. Alive, free, and our, our, our feminist network uh, sustain us. Let's end uh, the corporation sovereignty without um, without nurture, um, nutritional um, sovereignty, there is no real sovereignty. We believe that through this way, we're able to learn a language uh, that basically takes place in the streets, but has repercussions onto our everyday lives. And this basically diagnoses uh, systemic violence and at the same time, doesn't put us into the position of a victim that is basically the characterization of violence itself. Speaking about violence, about fear, about fragility from a position of an organized fight and resistance has been a very, very essential part of the, the, the feminist movements of the past years. And in order to destroy this form of binary um, and of um, in order to 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 move towards a, a politics of a fight and find different strategies um, and de develop a form of a uh, new form of language in order to articulate this form of fight, bring the visibility to the structuralization of these violence. I believe that the the feminist demonstrations, different mobilizations. The campaigns, international campaigns for the legalization um, of they have been organizing a real like a constellation of organization. They are trying to fight the, 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 the structural impunity, the colonial patriarchal systems of violence 
and basically put the political, um, economical, from this, uh, from this position they have constructed during the pandemic from the uh, feminism, an urgency for an, for an economic autonomy that uh, have basically like the pandemic that has caused has has caused has showed us a lot um has showed us a lot of structural problems that we are facing on an everyday basis like the income crisis public uh, lack of public funding this has constructed a form of urgency of the the demands of uh, economic autonomy in this sense the demand for justice against femicides <laughs> the, the demand for justice against femicides and against feminicides has are very much connected to the conditions of uh, of life that help us to get out of these uh, these uh, relations of violence. How to not fall into a necro political uh, structure of femicide that we know that the hegemonic narrations um, basically insist um, or are connected to the necropolitics that basically make us um, hopeless and um, take our agency away. Despite the, the move, this feminist movement, despite its radicalization, the numbers of the, the basically the violence happening within society is still taking place. I think this is something that we still have to work on in order to in order to not um, see this as a as like as a, a weakness of the movement. We know that in in terms of the question of justice, it's a very complex and important um, po uh, complexity. There is a form of backlash and uh, like especially in terms of like the punitive um punitive system um interplaying with the feminine we basically are moving in different spaces uh, developing different forms of ways of doing justice and producing justice that are in dialogue with the institutions and have different demands however I believe that we have managed within the pandemic to speak about the violences as a everyday experience without it being a private question. It's not nothing happening in the shadows anymore. It's nothing taking place between interpersonal relations. We have achieved within the pandemic to sustain this logic. And it has to do something with the sensibility of uh, feminist sensibilities that have denounced but equally showed onto the roots of these structural problems. And they have basically let showed how the patriarchal violence within the neoliberal uh, structures that we are living in, the tension in This shows that this produces not only an analysis about the violences, but equally produces a position, a subjective way of organizing in order to confront them. And equally, there's a denunciation of a collective organizing, and not just for individual problems, but equally collective in order to how to confront these violences. This organization, in order to fight the violences, has also to do with how to point out, point at what, are, what do we need to, to, to confront these violences once we have realized the structural problems. I'm not sure, Julia, if you want me to, to stop here and, and continue with the other questions or should I move on? What do you mean by the further questions? 
uh, in terms of the time. Should I stop my intervention here because it's already been 15 minutes or should I continue speaking a little bit or should we pass the word to Elsa and then I'll come back? If, if you want to continue speaking for a little bit, uh, feel free. I want to synthesize certain questions, especially the important, importance of what was the characterization of them from the feminist perspective of the violence during pandemics, and especially the question of work and what work means, uh, what care work means, what is a form of essential work. I also believe that that basically gave space to syndicalist forms of organizing within the feminist movement, um, especially within the, the framework of syndicalist organizing basically giving recognition to care work uh, that uh, and this uh, recognition has basically put been put into syndicalist work and into uh, community work and uh, that has is connected to the to right to remuneration so basically being paid for the work that you are doing the question of housing and home it's very rare is um, needs to be pr like a recognize the space of problematization. Now we see that uh, the violence, domestic violence and financial violence continue within um, the private housing. And um, a form of indebtment um, in terms of, of uh, it, within the framework of unpaid care work and reproductive work, all these are part of a logistical, uh, cheap um, logic of capitalism, uh, basically taking the responsibility of reproductive work within our houses. We need to produce platforms that basically, uh, basically exploit um, those working within the capitalist system and are not paid for the work. I believe that the feminist movement has sent the sensitized about this uh, topic, especially part of the, the um, feminist um, um, strike. In terms of the question of work and housing, it's been fundamental, especially in Argentina, this like perseverance of organizing, in, especially in the topic of abortion, what demonstrates that the notion, uh, basically the, the question of health is being amplified. And there's a lot of uh, feminist initiatives who are basically uh, discussing what do we mean by health. And um, a lot of feminist movements are basically uh, pressurizing to, to, to discuss these topics and like how the pandemic has basically pushed us to recognize um, our network our support networks and basically we have been able to sustain ourselves thanks feminist network during the pan this is part of the quote i have said like uh, during the pandemic our feminist movements are sustaining us like within this care structures this like wide um structure um that basically the state has not uh, sufficiently been supporting us um, a lot of the urgencies and um, the production. Yeah, yeah basically these, these structures have jumped where the state has failed. The, the feminist uh, fights have basically come out of the shadows to the forefront and that um, the violence and um, domestic violence and you basically showed us how, how different um, And with this wide perspective, and with this wide perspective, I'm I'm really happy to pass the words to to Elsa now. Thank you, Elsa. 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 Thank you
Concerning effective and social dynamics, we sent you questions in this uh, pandemic of violence and uh, to forms of empathic sub subjectification, uh, to how to tackle feelings of powerlessness. A lot of questions we gave to you and we are very much looking forward to hear your perspective on the topic. Uh, Thank you a lot and thank you for the organization of this uh, conversation and thanks to everyone who made it possible and thanks to the interpreting collective that makes it possible for me to express myself in French. So many thanks and I'm very, very glad to be here with Veronica today to take part together with her. That I'm very touched by that. My perspective is that, of course, I would like to um, this, this term of feminicide and this imagination around it is not is a global question, and it is very important to include patriarchal terrorism in that matter, which means a terrorist regime of bodies in a continuum of economic and sexualized violences um, who are inherent of capitalism. And in the wake of this pandemic we saw, and in the wake of the still ongoing crisis, we are seeing that we saw what it means to be exposed to risk of death. We have touched different social questions and the risk of death is concerning more and more people. That is something we see very clearly. In my opinion, it's very important to get back to patriarchy which is a deathly neoliberal mechanism and to include this deathly dimension and to ask the question of feminicide as a paradigmatic expression of um, this problem. That is why I think that it should be a part of all contemporary feminist movement, this question about uh, violence. And those movements have radicalized the question of violence and have um, have made possible a, system, a systematic analysis of patriarchy and patriarchic uh, violence. For me, that means, most of all, that there is that reproduction of material conditions of existence is a very uh, important topic. The paradoxon is that the reproductive sphere of our existen existence conditions, conditions of existence, what I am trying to show is uh, is the paroxystic point that of resistance as a survey like um, a survival practice. So, what I would like to elaborate on is that we are facing an impossibility of just leading our lives and that we are exposed to such epistemic violence that facing police brutality and uh, state violence in democratic states and facing a justice system uh, that has a huge influence on our lives. There is 
face à un adhérent to uh, self-defense that is a logical consequence of the sacking of our uh, our means of life and what veronica veronica said about the question of privatization and the destruction of um, communal resources de nos familles et notamment ce qui I'm a été thinking about geopolitical uh, organization uh, of français uh, I'm sorry there's a technical problem with the uh, German interpretation et de la montée des nationalismes des fascistes la question des frontières des murs there is the question of borders of walls of checkpoints there's uh, the question of the relation with territory and when we talk about the organization of our life and the um, that modern uh, places of sexual, or racial, and uh, of segregation, uh, we have a very popular, a very great majority in France that is racialized and popularized. And they uh, are caring, they are cleaning, they are bringing out the garbage for a wide bourgeois uh, class. And basically, they are less defenseless to this uh, violence that is structural violence. So the idea of patriarchal terrorism as one of the pillars of neoliberalism is what I'm working on in this paradox situation of the reproductive sphere of uh, reproductive uh, of life and uh, being let die if your life is considered less worthy. So what is very important is everything that happens in the reproductive sphere of life uh, and its organization is connected to an exposure to extreme risks of life. There is an ideological war really that uh, consists of derealizing this violence and this risk of death in the reproductive sphere. sphere. So historically, this question of a constitutional division of the public and the private sphere was a means of depoliticizing and invisibilizing and derealizing, so to speak, um, the uh, the brutal um, relationship of the, the state and the citizens. So, this is important for the uh, disting for distinguishing life that are considered worthy of living and lives that are considered less worthy of living. And so coming back to this ideological war, there is a systematic patriarchal violence and particularly the, in its form of feminist science, are dispositive of uh, multiple forms of discrimination that I uh, want to remind us of uh, numbers and uh, effects. There are so many victims. It is important to remember the name. <laughs> Donc il y a donc ces dispositifs 
So the yeah, yeah. Is this positive of derealization, which I just explained. So even in view of the numbers and the facts we see, uh, one of the means and the discursive form um, in this war is how we speak about feminicides. So if it's uh, dramas at home or if it's uh, deeds of uh, jealousy. So on an international level, we are permanently and visually uh, confronted with a regime, regime of uh, invisibilization that makes invisible the bodies of women and this regime, regime uh, produces a form of powerlessness and it creates a category of victims that uh, are due to an invisible and omnipotent aggressor. The capacity of hurting and uh, of letting and making die is left to the aggressors. So there is um, a whitewashing of institutions or a whitening of institutions that make it even possible in the first place and that allow it to happen, that allow this immense dimension of sexualized violence to exist. It is also a dispositive that is psychologizing and individualizing being a victim of violence uh, that are um, left alone to defend themselves. So those, uh, when we speak about that, it's often in racist and very culturalist terms. And Là encore, le dispositif se joue. If we take an anthropologic treat or feature of uh, these or that uh, religious uh, or cultural group or ethnic, we see the mechanism of the realization and its consequences. And we have to think about those consequences. We have to uh, create a consciousness about those consequences. Historically, this question has been reviewed and reread many times. The threshold between one's own experiences and their politicization within a framework of a consciousness, of an awakening of political consciousness about one's own experiences is extremely important and is means of creating a collectiveness and commonality. So to get from the individualized perspective to a collective perspective is extremely important. It is very important that within our conditions of neoliberalism, uh, when we speak about the words we use or the narratives we use, we have to change uh, the narratives and the histories of violence. The consequence of this would be 
a derealization or the consequence of not doing that would be a derealization not only of the self but not only ideally but on a physical level even which also means that the word or the narrative for example the word violence plays a very important role in uh, facing the legal system so, so because why I'm re very reserved on the question of uh, the words and the, the narratives, we have to gain consciousness of the narrative to try to think of the political dimension on the personal level. We have to question on the individual level the possibility of creating a movement. Why am I talking so much about the individual level or the personal level? Uh, how am I in time? So why am I talking about the individuality? There are two elements. The first one, it seems that there is something very intrinsically political in uh, prosaic, very individual self-defense tactics that are self-defense forms that facing the derealization of the self allow oneself to um, to give meaning, a uh, new meaning to one's own existence. And the second one is in day-to-day uh, -day self defense that has just something to do with survival. The for the think of real combat start or has to take place in the reproductive sphere as well as well. So we don't only talk about micropolitics here, but also about necropolitics. So in feminist speech, we have to reread this question of uh, self-defense, even on an intimate level. Thank you, Elsa. Many thanks to both of you. That was very broad. Thanks also for your own subjective positions and perspectives uh, from which you regard this field of uh, discussion. So we are very ambitious. The uh, title is already against patriarchy and powerlessness and fear and then there's the effective donor uh, dimensions and there's the pandemic so that's a very broad field so to narrow it down a little i would ask both of you to maybe tell me a very concrete situation you say both of you those uh, relations of violence, uh, you show them on many levels. It's not only patriarchal violence, it's interwoven with racist uh, violence and neoliberalist exploitation. So that opens up an entire matrix. And you are very capable of putting that, uh, of, of uh, explaining that on a very um, broad level, but maybe could you bring it back to a very small, specific example? Thank you. And what do effects have to do with that, if that's possible to include even that 
in my question. Would any one of you like to start? Um, I believe like these questions have a lot of uh, similar like common points that we're discussing that are uh, we are able to synthesize as a feminist program against the precarity of life, precaritization of life, a form of reading these multiple forms of violences that are basically mirroring themselves in the concept of reproduction. What do um, initiatives uh, do within this, uh, this sphere? Um, that basically as uh, are um, these are the spheres that most of the neoliberal extractivist policies are basically enabling themselves at the moment the the topic of appropriation of time in the in the space of uh, what that would a collective repro reproduction basically how to how to localize um for me it would be important how to um combine self-defense how forms of uh, self-defense um resources self-organization feminist movements are forms of direct forms of self-defense so the material uh, area of resources and the dimension where the maturity of these resources basically strengthens us in psychological terms and affective terms in terms of trust in order to respond to violences. Do you have a specific example where self-defense are basically and uh, self-organization basically come together? I believe a campaign that uh, feminist organizations during the pandemic did that was called the promoters are taking care of us. The promoters, the territorials are different friends, different uh, women, LGBTIQ people who have organized different initiatives in front of the emergency of life, the health, the uh, gender-based violence and nutrition. It was a political work that wasn't organized in terms of wage work. Therefore, I believe like this, this phrase, the promoters are taking care of us, especially with the figure of the promoter, um, into a figure that represents a community, um, community care work. There is a form of recognition within the state that without the self form of organization that without self organization there would be no form of organization within the pandemic at the same time there is a form of exploitation of these these uh, protect this, these women these uh, community carers they're basically supporting us but at the same time they take like basically their bodies are almost damaged through this hard work that they are doing this um, making of a political campaign that's basically linking um, self-defense and self-organizations is essential. And also, how do we discuss um, public uh, resources? Like, how can we link this with um, public um, resources and discussions uh, about them? The, the confrontation of the domestic debt has uh, become a way of basically indebting, collectively indebting ourselves. And the debt is a financial tool that basically is used against, um, used to, um, as a financial financial instrument and what we're discussing from a penis is how to take this debt away from us um, and in front of the colonization, like a financial colonization. 
And this is basically the concept of defending ourselves from the finances, what basically defending ourselves from like the most extra abstract tool of capitalism. We see a lot of problems. Basically, if you want to take a mortgage um, in abusive conditions, basically can resolve your everyday problems. And there's a lot of initiatives are basically supporting this, taking the debt away and debting oneself. This is a way of uh, linking self-organization and self-defense in order to fight most abstract violence like the financial vi uh, financial um, violence, and especially financial violence that is basically linked to mach machist uh, violence. Feminist initiatives are trying to conceptualize and activate against what seems to be like the, the most invisible form of violence, the, the financial violence. It uh, seems to be like a form of violence in the macro politics, but at the same time, it's a, a form of violence taking place in our private lives, on our bodies. We're not going to pay with our bodies and with our territories it's it's a it's a very important discussion in um, in the feminist movement in Latin America. It's equally putting a concrete dispute uh, onto where are the costs of this crisis going to to reach? Who is going to pay for this crisis? This is uh, also linked to, to self defense as a form of. Um, fight against um, housing um, precarities. Elsa, do you want to, to, to link this with a concrete formulation? Um, what you're saying, how the form of patriarchal violence are linked to other forms of violence within the pandemic and how basically, and uh, can you give us an example of a form of resistance? So this has intrinsically to do with living conditions during the pandemic. So the core question would be, in the confinement, in the lockdown, what happened in France is we had a very harsh lockdown with very uh, authoritarian police surveillance and measures. And at the same time, we have this idea of the home being a microcosm, cosmos, um, that the global level can be found in one's own home. And during the lockdown, we also had the idea of self-organization, but the also uh, of intensively, we saw very, uh, we saw very intense situations of sexual, uh, racial exploitation. So a thought that I find very important is we had a very harsh uh, notion of um, exhausting oneself in collective organization and, and collective solidarity uh, so we have the question of who has access to to care and to the health system, and we uh, exhausted ourselves in uh, solving that our way, as we saw that access was not possible. So the ethics of feminist self-defense are traditionally we had physical techniques. And almost all of them uh, apply to when we are locked up in a very limited space. 
So that has a lot to do with sexualized and gender-based violence that happen in uh, in very closed spaces, in little rooms uh, when you're locked between two walls. So we there is a history of real combat techniques for li for small spaces in feminist history. So something that's very that has a symbolic value for me is an intelligence of real combat, a real materialization of this antagonism uh, that we experience, that this is really a means of countering this entire discourse of derealization of violence. They allow our bodies to uh, redefine ourselves. And to something that was very interesting for me now, uh, is very interesting for me now at this historic moment, is to grab the conditions of violence and we are in a hiatus uh, facing current forms of violence because the ideological projection against defending ourselves is too strong. So uh, confrontation in real circumstances uh, has real consequence for power dynamics and power relations. And under such circumstances, what does militancy mean for you? The means on the possibilities of escaping, of getting out um, from, for example, an abuser, a perpetrator, when that possibility, for example, in a lockdown does not exist anymore because so much takes place in the street, but not only in the street. Um, we have to think about collectivizing the domestic sphere and to include this sphere in our alliances. So what did the lockdown do to our ideas and um, ideas of militancy, seeing neoliberalism have such an influence over people's bodies as they are forced into indebtment. So how did the pandemic influence militancy in feminist movements? Is militancy still alive? Is it necessary that it still exists? Should I answer? That made me think of the question of uh, self-defense as invisible work. There is self-defense, feminist self-defense, uh, women and uh, then the minorities and just individuals, small uh, collectives, uh, pauperized communities. They just act to uh, survive. So that self-defense is an invisible act. So the question of militancy is first and foremost work that exhausts ourselves. For example, uh, in uh, a border situation, uh, in a conversation or in a situation with a doctor, in a confrontation with police violence, trying to cross a border. All of these situations are exhausted, uh, exhausting, and they are self defense. So the question of the Police dispositive uh, touch the um, occupation of public space as a place of struggle 
and this space had become very risky and you uh, you risk to um, obtain grave uh, uh, wounds during, for example, demonstrations in the tree. So, you can be severely blessed. So, we are, it is about visibility and that has its historically important moment because the relation to the entire world is defined by resisting as a feminist. That is becoming and making reality. So, for example, the picture of uh, wanting to shout, but the shout gets stuck in uh, my throat. So that is beyond reality. So becoming a feminist is a very intimate process that has something to do with, for example, our, uh, our senses. So all those movements, contemporary movements and feminist movements, have to take that into account time and time again. Uh, thank you, Elsa. That was very powerful. So, Vero, um, before you can react to the question, um, again, to all those listening and watching, if you would like you can always, you're welcome to post questions into the chat. Um, I would have some as well, but please do ask your questions. So would you want to react, Vero? We always look to Latin America. We have the feminists fighting and struggling there. And um, so how did the understanding of militancy, militancy change during the pandemic in Latin America from your perspective? I think that the pandemic um, brought about new forms of resistance and it came into the public sphere and that public sphere was a common sphere so the limitations of public sphere were were visible and we took that sphere and the work of solidarity in the quarters in the city um, has become visible and that brought more and more feminists to the street so these forms of lockdown, these forms of coping with crisis, has uh, brought about an intensification of social classes. Feminist movements create spaces of movement where exchange is possible, where common work is possible. And that dynamic is incredible. We had uh, courses, we had workshops, we had um, assemblies, and we had this big um, encounter of women and queers in Argentina. Um, it used to be a, an encounter or a meeting of women, and now it is women and queers. And that took place, and it is a very important space for defining the agenda of feminism in Argentina. So that meeting was interrupted by the pandemic. So spaces were missing for political exchange. Mobility in, within the cities was limited. The, the access of public resources was limited. Housing situation, healthcare situation got very difficult in various ways for different people. And this collective space we had created Thank you, Vero. 
¿Quieren que repita algo? Vielleicht sagt doch noch mal den letzten Satz. Maybe to repeat the last sentence. It was the question to be a bit, a bit slower. So, lockdown in different phases of the pandemic, the lockdown inhibited the politicization of public spheres. So, new forms of connectedness were being found and new common territories were uncovered. That explains how survival during the pandemic was even possible without these common territories, those networks, those built infrastructures for the collective. And without those infrastructures that were created before, it would not have been possible to survive in, in the way it was possible. And I say that in spite of all the deaths and the dramatic situations we saw, but without those networks, the situation would have been much more severe. So feminists created self-organized and self-defensive care structures. Uh, so self-organization is easy to understand. Also, for example, the organization and the administration of resources. So how do we get together? We work. We have a lot less income. And with that, we have less time for self-organization. For example, time to attend an assembly or a meeting. No idea how long it can take, but I need time to get there and back to a political meeting. So this reminds me of the topic of the backlash. We had already uh, reached that time we always say we are here for us, for ourselves. So the idea was about finding space and time to get into an exchange and to organize ourselves on a political level. And as we had less time, we had less time for political organization. That in itself is the foundation of political projects. And so I think it's a struggle of body against body or a very direct fight to find time to make possible collective work. So we are in a situation to work more, to earn less. So it's new forms that challenge our and limit our, uh, our capacities of organization. So that is a big, big challenge to reconquer those spaces where we could meet and the places for care, for mutual care, for, uh, for being calm, because we're exhausted. We need the space to calm down, to rest, to regenerate of everything we went through during the past two years. So you are trying to frame militancy as a work, a form of work, and you include creating time into militancy. That reminds me of a German children's book that where we have the time thieves and there is a girl, Momo, uh, that escapes the time thieves by living her time in a very uh, own way by not uh, creating extra value out of her time. So Momo is a person that opens up social spaces in which people can get into contact, uh, uh, develop a we, develop a common space um, and a feeling of community. So in this moment of re-realization that you mentioned, of re-realization of one's own relation to political moment, uh, political movement, I saw when reading your books that you relate a lot to the term of territory. As a you quote, the writer Jordan June by saying, it's not about uh, staying safe in a phantasmagorical uh, community, but about creating territories 
out of which you can politicize anger. And Vero, you uh, write of the body as a composition of effects and possibilities that are not individual, but as a network in that can be intervened into and that has to defend itself. So maybe do explain this idea of territories that I find very fascinating. And that says a lot about how do we get, uh, how do we become subject, uh, subjectivity? So how does our subjectivity relate to territory and territory as a common place of struggle? I should not ask two questions at once always. So please do answer the first one. I think that there's a lot of echo of uh, in my uh, thought of what Veronica said. I believe and especially the material dimension, a, a, very, a very intense dimension. The question is, what is your own relation to the word and how are you anchored in it? Questions that you are not able to breathe. These, these effects um, basically giving new reality uh, through self-defense. There is a new cartography of your own relation to the world. in order to basically anchor this in a new bodily reality. So we have something very close to Fanon, uh, to Franz Fanon in this idea, which is Uh, in Les Damiers de la Terre, uh, the book of Fanon, facing the brutality of colonial order that pushes, that determines the um, colonized to, uh, to live only in a dream of defend themselves, the dream of uh, marching, of running, of fighting, the, of revenge and this idea i think it's still present when we when we encounter a, a subject that is when we are at Sorry, the sound was very bad. So, in political practices, we have the territory of the dominant parties, and it political power would be to make it your own territory. So, we have an entire genealogy of resistance and. Um, the idea of um, of of escaping, of uh, leaving the the colonialized territory, um, it's used to, uh, or it's very important for the vision of creating community and to build a new world, and so. This idea is at the core of the feminist movement, the 
struggle against nationalism and and against fascist tendencies as opposed to forms of separatism and self-organization of life um, outside a cap patriarchal capitalism. Vero, would you like to answer? Elsa, I really like your, your genealogy uh, and how you open up this territory and how you uh, put life to it into it and how you related it to Fanon and I found that very important but I do also think that with Vero's idea of a physical territory there is a resonance with that and Vero I would like to give you the opportunity to react to this question and then we have a question in the chat by Eva von Riedeker. Vero would you like In order to quote his genealogy, I think it's interesting how in Latin America the 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 body territory uh, concept has changed into a key concept for unifying anti-extractivist fights with the fights of defense of territories and the defense of from feminism and from women who are protagonists of anti-extractivist fights and creating a common space and how this uh, idea of cuerpo territorio of body space can basically uh, fight against and face against anti patriarchal and um, critique who are trying to recolonize these spaces and bodies and it's a way of basically how this is not an individual struggle I believe that this concept that basically has diffused from these fights, how this, 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 this concept basically emerges from these fights and has been like changed and reconceptualized in different, um, from different traditions, has the capacity to connect basically and extend uh, it to cuerpo territorio, body territory in order to stop the process of recolonization um, like this way of colonial thinking which which uh, type uh, of abuse and exploitation that are basically nowadays directed precisely towards certain territories and certain bodies and why feminist fights are the ones that are realizing of the capacity of the form of resistance in terms of cuerpo territorio body territory it's a very interesting uh, question of like actualizing anti-colonialist struggles, connecting them to anti-extractivist struggles, whilst at the same time connecting them to our own bodies. These are connected to black feminism, indigenous feminism, peripheral feminisms who are putting this notion as a as a key notion in order to rethink basically the, the figure of uh, subjectivity of the subjects, what we were speaking about before, what are the territories, what are the collective territories who, which enable pro social reproduction. And from this again, once again, how to place this dimension of re collective reproductions and the aggressions and confiscations, um, extractive confiscations over the collective reproduction. And this, uh, this questions of collectivizing subjectivity with the territoriality in the pandemic, please keep it in the back of your mind. Um, I would like to have it as the, 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 the last question, the last statement. And now I would like to give the stage to the, or, uh, to the question of Eva. Um, would you like to throw the question in, please? And now it should be solved. So it's basically about the question of the relations between self-defense and and reproduction. Um, I, I really want to, she, she's really thankful for your input and her question, how can we basically um, link these two struggles without making um, it heroic? 
think about it about reproductive work and about what Maya Williamson call are calling revolutionary murdering because if you say that if we live in necro capitalism or that femicide is a pragmatic paradigmatic act in neoliberalism would she agree then uh, the militant defense against that need always be both defense of life but also regener regeneration of precarious life working against death so to say or care as the